Welcome to the Sunday School Lesson Review hosted by the pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church, Brother Lars Jordan. The subject of this week's lesson is, Written on the Heart. The scripture reading is coming from Jeremiah 31st chapter, verses 27 through 34. Please, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. After you click the subscribe button, make sure you click the notification bell for future lessons. Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church, located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. If you'll pardon my hoarseness today, our lesson today for November the 12th, 2017, is the seventh lesson of this quarter, according to Boyd's, is Written on the Heart. And our unifying topic, as well as our international topic, is Promise. Of a new covenant. Our Bible scriptures today are taken from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 27 through verse 34. And our background scripture is the entire 31st chapter of Jeremiah. And our lesson today is moving right along in these covenants. The covenant with God is the section that we're dealing with at this time. And the specific session that we're dealing with is an everlasting covenant. And we've been going through the covenant for some time now, so we have kind of given it a definition that we have been going by as we've been going through this. First of all, a covenant is an agreement between two or more people or groups that involve a promise or agreement on the part of each party. And these promises or agreements usually kind of govern the relationship between the two different groups or parties. Now, we also know that there is a covenant that is totally different than just a regular covenant. There is a divine covenant. A divine covenant would have a superior the superior will always be God in a divine covenant, and there will always be an inferior. If there's a superior, there has to be someone that is an inferior. Man would always be the inferior. And in that divine covenant, there will be certain elements that will always be involved in a divine covenant. Now, may, it may not be with just a regular covenant between two parties or two men or two groups of people. But with a divine covenant, these will be the elements. First of all, they would be originated by God. It may seem like man kind of brought along the thought, but God has all knowing thoughts. So it all is originated by God himself. The covenant will always be everlasting, that divine covenant. It'll be everlasting. If it is only lasting, everlasting through the person of Jesus Christ, because it will have to be fulfilled if it is a divine covenant. And it will always have a visible sign. If that visible sign is no more than the changed life of the people that God made the covenant with. And as we go in deeper into the covenant today, the, this everlasting covenant, this section right here, we're in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. Most of us know quite a bit about the prophet Jeremiah is as much as we can know about any prophet. There are some prophets that had a, a great calling. There was the prophet Isaiah that we we know about as he was called to, to be a prophet in a most spectacular type of way. He was already a prophet, but his real call to be a special man before God was in a spectacular way as the Lord had came in with the angels and they had touched his lips. But Jeremiah came in in a special type way in the first chapter of Jeremiah 
also, as the Lord had called him and told him that I had called you and knew you, and you were going to be my prophet and my man before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. God already knew this man. This man that would be a, a prophet, some would say, and call him a prophet of doom. Most of us know him to be called a weeping prophet because he saw the sins of the people and it really broke his heart. Just as we saw Jesus as he looked out over Jerusalem and began to weep himself. This, this man that would speak all of this doom we get to a chapter here where he finally gets to say something that is promising, something that has hope tied into it. When other prophets came along that were false prophets and would say different things, Jeremiah would hope that they were telling something that was true, but he knew that God spoke directly to him and through him as given to us there in the first chapter of Jeremiah, God let him know that his word was going to be in him. He was going to put his words in his mouth as he had touched his lips. And all he could speak was that which was what God wanted him to say. This man was told something that would be in our printed text today. In the second chapter, how his prophet, prophetic ministry would be. It would be something that would tear down. It would pull down. It would, it would root out. And then the rest of the things that we have in our printed text today, but it would also have a prophetic message of building up. And today he gets to say something on God's behalf that is really good in this lesson today this promise of a new covenant. We'll find this covenant it, the, to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Not necessarily every bit of it fulfilled at this time, because if you read this, you'll know that all of these things haven't come into being yet. So some of them will definitely be talking about the millennial kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back to establish his kingdom here on earth. So we get started into this lesson today in the 27th verse of this 31st chapter with this prophet that had been speaking so much doom, but now has a message of hope. He said, behold, or as one, uh, one commentary rendered it, pay close attention to this. This is something that is going to change everything. He said, behold, lend your ear, come just a little bit closer and hear what is being said at this time. He said, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. The Lord said that the day is coming when I will sow again or plant or repopulate this particular area, these areas, the, the land that of, of Israel, what we know to be Israel, the house of Israel was considered to us to be the Northern Territory, not the Southern Territory at that time. That would be the the, the house of Judah there. But the Northern Territory and the Southern Territory were ripped apart after the kingship of Solomon. He was told it wouldn't happen during his time, but after he had gone off of the scene, the, the different tribes, 10 of the tribes went North and two of them stayed South. And that's the Northern Territory became those 10 tribes, and that was Israel, and the southern territory was Judah. So here we see that the house, God said that I will plant again or repopulate the, with the seed of man. Men are going to be there again in this area, in these areas that, that I promised to these people, and also 
the seed of beast. There will be animals there again. There will be food there again. In other words, is what the Lord is saying. Verse 28 says, and it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up. God said, I watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, and to destroy, and to afflict. So will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Now, Jeremiah these words were kind of uh, familiar to him as we had just stated that these were things that God told him would be a part of his ministry. So we he already knew that he would be a prophet of doom so much to the point that he, he in the 20th chapter, we find him at that position in his life where everyone had turned against him preaching all of these years, 40 years, preaching through the reign of five different kings, having one wonderful person, that King Josiah, that, that had that wonderful revival and got rid of the idols. But just as soon as he was off the scene and Jeremiah and the people had, had mourned over his death, there came in an ungodly king that brought back all of the idolatrous type of worship or in and around the temple and the people of God. But but now, Jeremiah told in the 20th chapter that he wasn't going to speak on God's behalf anymore. But as you can remember, he was the one that proclaimed that his word was like fire shut up in my bones. He couldn't hold back the word of God. He had to speak those things that God put in him. So God says here that I, have watched over them. I I am the one that, that sent them into captivity. How did it happen? First of all, he plucked them up. After Zedekiah made his strong rebellion against the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, he came in and he destroyed the temple in 586 BC, the Southern territory. But the Already the Northern Territory had been taken away into captivity long before Jeremiah came on the scene there in 722 BC when the Assyrians came in and took some of them captive but killed a lot of them. But now God said, I am I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down and to destroy. If you looked up these particular phrases in the Hebrew, you'll find that all of those phrases come in to this area of destroying. All of them except that word to afflict. To afflict would bring pain and anguish into the destroying of their land destroying of them or, or even them being plucked up and moved to another territory. The the affliction, the, the pain and, and the anguish would be brought in there with the to afflict. But look at the hope in this. The same God that said, I have washed over them to pluck up is the same one that says, so will I watch over them to do this also to build, to build and to plant, saith the Lord, to, to reestablish, to repair. We, we saw as we, we had looked at, at Nehemiah as he had came in and put back the walls of the city and, and the gates of the city. The, the temple had already been rebuilt, but God said that I will watch over this. This would be something that I would also be in charge of. So God said that I will watch over to build and to plant. These were familiar words to Jeremiah. Now that word plant in the Hebrew is something we have dealt with in a, in a, in a previous lesson. It, that word plant means to fasten, 
In other words, I'm going to latch you in. I'm going to put you in this place. It's going to be yours. And while I have you fastened there, no one can move you is what God is proclaiming there with that word to plant. Verse 29 said, in those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a, eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, you and I all have heard so many sermons on generational curses, and we, we continue to hear them. Even though the Bible is telling you now that as the, 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 the old saints, the, the older saints, or the mature saints of days gone by used to say that the Bible said, but the Bible didn't say it, but they couldn't read or write. So this was how they interpreted so that they could understand it when they would say that every tub will have to sit on its own bottom. It was it was saying the same thing that the Apostle Paul said in Romans 14 and 12 when he said, so then every one of us shall give account of God uh, to himself to God. Every one of us will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ is what the apostle Paul was saying there. We'll have to stand there for ourselves. We we can't claim that I, I, I smoked because mama smoked or I cussed because daddy used to cuss. We can't say that I drink because my old granddaddy was a drinker. We won't be able to bring in and say that these things are, I, this is the reason that I was caught up in this is because someone else will have to stand there before God for ourselves. For And that's what the Lord is saying here. You won't be able to say, yes, there are times when you will get caught up because or even get killed because of someone else's negligence in some type of way. But that's not the same as what these people were talking about at this time. They felt like they were under some type of generational curse. But these these particular things, he, uh, Elijah even had this proverb in his, in his teaching, and it was saying basically the same thing that Jeremiah is talking about, and they were contemporaries. It says here in the first, 31st verse, Behold, the day comes said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The, the day is coming that I will, not I have, to us he has in, 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 in a special and certain type of way, but it's going to be totally different when he makes this covenant with the household of Israel. That day is still coming. We hadn't seen this house, this this particular covenant come into being yet. Well, now he's not saying the covenant yet, but he's talking about he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the northern territory, and the house of Judah. And then verse 32 says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. He said, not according to the covenant that I made. In other words, when the people stood there at, at, at the mountain, at the foothills of the mountain, and God gave them his law, uh, or when the old man came down the, the side of the mountain with the tables in his hand that were made of stone that had the, the what we know as the Ten Commandments carved in it that would later be put into the Ark of the Covenant and representing God's presence with his people. But now these, he said, not, not like that, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them. By the hand, God led them by the hand out of the land of Egypt. He, he, he was the one that brought them out by his strong hand. And that's what it is represented here in these scriptures. But look at that covenant, which my covenant they break. Now, here is what's one thing that you'll find, and we talked about it in, in the last lesson and some of the previous lessons. You'll find that that covenant 
was never really meant to make a person righteous, to declare them righteous. It was to be a schoolmaster is what the Apostle Paul said, to point a person to Christ, to realize, but to help them realize their inability to keep it. It was the mirror that they had in front of them and see that there is a problem with their face. There is some dirt or something on their face. You don't take the mirror and begin to wipe your face. And the, that was the problem with the law. The law was perfect, but it couldn't do anything about the problem other than identify it. But now the Lord said that they broke it and, and now there needs to be something to help man. So he's going to make a new covenant with them. He said, even though at that time I was a husband to them. In other words, he was saying that now I have basically divorced them. But look at the special part of this promise. He said in the 33rd verse here, he said, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, he doesn't say with the house of Judah at this time. Now he's grouping them all together as one family again. They're not separated anymore. There's not the Northern Territory and the Southern Territory. This is going to come in in the Millennial Kingdom. They will not be fighting over who is the North and who is the, who is the South or, or as, as we see challenging teams now on the on the field saying that our team is better and this team is better. They will all be one and not fighting against each other at that time. He said, but this is the covenant that I, God said, I, I will make with the house of Israel. I'm going to make the covenant. Remember, we told you that the covenant, the, the divine covenant, they will be originated by God. Most of the time you will see God call them out as being his and and he said, I will make this covenant. This will be his covenant with the house of Israel. After those days, wow, not many people want to deal with the part after those days because we would like those days to always be what we're talking about right now. But after those days for the household of Israel would be the millennial kingdom. Yet the after those days in the immediate for us as the church right now and for them, but it will only be come to fruition for them in the millennial kingdom was when Jesus Christ came and died at Calvary's cross, on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose again three days later. Those days, those days when all of these things could, could be a part of the life of the believer. He said, after those days, saith the Lord, look at how special this is. He said, I will put my law in their inward parts. You'll find these particular words, these, these phrases also mentioned in, in, in Hebrews, in, in the 8th chapter of Hebrews, also some of it in the 10th in the chapter of Hebrews, but, and, when it, and, and it actually just not talking just about the Israelites at that time, it kind of engrafts in, in the church in to these things. But he said at that time, after those days, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at how special that, that is. God said, I will put my law in their inward parts. Now, right now, even for the church, the law is is standing there as our schoolmaster. He's still standing there. You and I can't put him away because he was perfect and he is still there. Yet someone has to fulfill that righteous standard that God has put out there, that moral and righteous standard. But the problem is we find ourselves just as the Israelites at that time, we would break that covenant. But God said that there's going to come a day when I will put my law in their inward parts. Now, his law is to be written on the tables of our heart. But we still, right now, in this particular uh, element that we're in, we still have the old man. 
We still have that fellow that, that has been rendered inactive, but will rear his ugly head every now and then. But there is going to come a day. Look at how special this word is. He said, I will put my law in their inward parts, in the, the, the very being themselves, write it in their hearts. Their hearts, their, their innermost being, the mind, the will, the emotion, the place where all of these things are kept. And, and, and at this time, you and I find ourselves faltering and failing in this area and in that area. And we wonder if this is written on the table by heart. But if this comes to a place where it is written on the tables of our heart, the old control that we, we had was based on our conduct. The law always pointed a finger at us and said, you got that wrong. But the new covenant, when it takes over totally and completely, it hadn't got there yet. When it takes over whole, totally and completely, it's going to change the entire character where there is no desire. The flesh won't have any control anymore. That's what the that's what Jeremiah is talking about here as God is, is speaking through him. He said, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And will be their God. Now, put I in front of that if you want to keep up the understanding of that. He said, I will be their God. What, what does that mean? God said, I will be their God. I will be their very source of everything that they need. In other words, God, you will be everything to these people. He is everything to us right now. But still, that's a time when the Israelites... Those people, the, his, the people that were first given the oracles of God will realize this, that God, Elohim at this time, that's the word God, it means that it, he is the supreme one and he'll be their everything. He said, I will be their God and look at how special this is. Not only will I be their God, I will be the supreme one that stands before them, that walks before them, he said, and they shall be my people. Again, they will be my people. There at the end of the 31st verse, 32nd verse, he said, I was an husband to them. If you read it in Hebrews, it, it even makes it more serious than that. But now he's saying that everything has been fixed. It's back where it needs to be. And they shall be my people. Verse 34 says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. This is something that is quite special also, because I, I, I've read many commentaries and many people try to explain it, and usually they try to explain it away from what it's really saying. You and I know right now there is a need for teaching in a special type way, but even the Apostle John talked about it in, the, in, in, in 1 John, the third chapter. Verse two, we, we are the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. No, we won't be God, but we will have complete and true knowledge. There'll be knowledge that no man will have to teach us. We'll know God for ourselves. This knowledge is an intimate relationship with God evidenced by faith, obedience, and even total devotion to God. Then he said that at that time, there will be no need for that person to teach that person. We will know, know God. No, no need to tell every man his brother, but to know the Lord, for they shall all know me, God says. It, it, it'll be common knowledge. Everyone will know him. During the millennial kingdom, the man that sits on the throne, everyone will know 
Jesus Christ. They'll know, the, know him for themselves. Whether they're obedient to him or not, they will know him from the least of them to the greatest of them. Right now, we teach, we teach our young people. We have to teach them. The, it, it was Job that says that a man is but a few days and full of trouble. It, it's going to be a part of his life. It, no one really has to teach you how to get in trouble and do bad things. We have to teach you how to be good. We have to teach you how to do the right thing. But at that time, everyone is going to have knowledge from the, from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord. And look at how special this is. He said, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. It, it just won't come up in, in that type of way any, anymore. There is a, something in man. We can just about do anything. We can we can go to the moon. We can go to all types of places, even with a telescope, and, and go and look at things that are light years away. But there is one thing that man can't do. Man, can he can forgive a person, but he cannot forget it. Not unless he has Alzheimer's or, or dementia in some type of way. He still remember that you kicked him. But God. God is not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. But God said, I won't remember your sin or your iniquity anymore. And if God said it, he meant it. He means it. This is what he told the children of Israel. And this is what he also is telling the church right now. And how can he say it? Because of the person of Jesus Christ. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will simmer on our hearts all day long. Help us to understand this promise of a new covenant. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.